Hello, my name is Kevin Schivior and today I will talk about the paper entitled Unknown IID Profits, Better Bounds, Streaming Algorithms and a New Impossibility. This is joint work with Jose Correa, Paul Dütting, Felix Fischer and Bruno Ziliotto. In this paper we revisit profit inequalities for IID random variables from an unknown distribution and consider the three aspects mentioned in the title. For a little background, I will first talk about the IID profit inequality, that is the profit inequality for IID random variables from a known distribution. This inequality refers to the following mathematically very clean setting. So there is a distribution f on the positive real numbers and a natural number n known up front. And now a decision maker is presented with a sequence of independent draws x1 up to xn from this distribution f. These draws are also depicted up here. And now they will be revealed from the left to the right. Yeah. And the decision maker's task is to select a single one of these draws at the time when this draw is revealed. We refer to the selected draw as x tau, where tau is also called the stopping time. Let's go through a quick example of how this process works. So first x1 is revealed, yeah. let's say it's 8. Uh, and the decision maker has to decide whether to select this value or not. Let's say, knowing f, the decision maker decides not to select this value. Yeah. And now x2 is revealed and turns out that value is 5. The decision maker may again decide not to select this value. Um, then x3 is revealed, turns out to be 13. Now the decision maker may say, let's select this value. Then tau will be set to 3 and all other draws, no matter what, what their values are, are automatically rejected because uh, the decision maker uh, may only select a single one of the draws. So that's the setting. Now what does the profit inequality say about the setting? Well, it compares the expected value that the decision maker can select um, with the expected value of the profit, that is the expected value that an all-knowing profit would select when they would see all the draws up front. Yeah? So this is precisely uh, the expected maximum of all the draws. So more specifically, the IRD profit inequality says that there is a stopping rule for the decision maker such that for all n and f, uh, the expected value that the decision maker selects using the stopping rule uh, is at least an alpha fraction of uh, the value of the profit, where this alpha is a number that doesn't have a closed form expression and is roughly 0.745. This inequality with this precise constant is due to an EC17 paper by Korea and others. And it matches, in fact, an impossibility result due to Helen Kertz uh, from the Annals of Probability of um, 82. So this constant alpha here on the right hand side is in fact best possible. Okay, so this is the IID profit inequality. Um, let me also say a few words about applications um, that have caused quite some interest in profit inequalities in the past few years and in fact also um, quite some nice results on profit inequalities. So one application is in mechanism design and algorithmic pricing because uh, one may imagine uh, these draws as valuations of customers for a certain product. A second application is in beyond the worst case analysis of online algorithms because one may interpret what I just told you as uh, beyond the worst case analysis of an online version of the very simple problem of selecting the maximum of a sequence. What arguably makes results for this and related models, however less applicable in the real world, is um, the strong assumption that the um, distribution f is precisely known. Yeah? And this strong assumption will be relaxed in the next model that I will talk about, where uh, we'll assume that only k samples for some number k um, from f are known and we'll refer to these samples as S1 up to SK. 
This precise model has been introduced in an EC19 paper by a subset of the authors of this paper, um, but a similar assumption had been made before for related models by Azar, Kleinberg and Weinberg in a SOTA14 paper. A major goal of the research into this problem has been getting a similar kind of guarantee as for the previous problem. So more precisely, the goal can be formulated as finding a pointwise largest function alpha that gets as input um, the number of samples and the number of values on which uh, the decision maker and profit can stop and output some guarantee between zero and one with the following property. There exists a stopping rule that in expectation selects a value that's at least uh, the corresponding value of alpha times um, the value of the profit. And that should hold uh, for every numbers of values and uh, for every uh, distribution f. Some remarks about this. Well, first off, um, such settings usually become most mathematically clean and interesting uh, when n is large. Yeah, so uh, we'll in fact later consider a large n. Um, also, as we showed in uh, the C19 paper, uh, when the number of samples is sublinear in n, then um, the best possible guarantee um, one can find here is essentially 1 over e up to uh, terms that vanish when n becomes larger. On the other end of the spectrum, it was shown in last year's version of this conference by Rubinstein, Wang and Weinberg that uh, the guarantee of roughly 0.745 from the known distribution setting can already be approximately achieved with a linear number of samples. Yeah? So in other words, um, the setting when the number of samples is sublinear in n is essentially understood and um, there's no need to uh, use a superlinear number of samples. Therefore, um, Really, the most interesting setting is the linear regime, namely when the number of samples is linear in n. Yeah? And therefore, we will from now on focus on this linear regime. So let's say from now on we have uh, beta times n samples and we are looking for the achievable guarantee uh, as a function of beta. Yeah? And since we are really interested in the setting where n is large, uh, we don't uh, care about additive terms in the guarantee that vanish when n becomes large. So what's known about this achievable guarantee as a function of beta? I'm showing here the original bounds from the EC19 paper. On the left you can see um, upper and lower bounds on that guarantee um, really as a function of beta. And on the right, you can see the slice for beta equals one, also the lower and upper bound. Let me remark a few things about this. So let's first talk about this upper bound curve here. So because we have guarantees that are smaller than one, uh, these upper bounds correspond to impossibility results. That is results of the form. There's no stopping rule with a guarantee better than uh, something. Okay, so um, yeah, so this tight upper bound here uh, for beta equals one um, comes from a Ramsey theoretic construction that I won't repeat here anymore. But essentially, um, all these yeah, so all these uh, upper bounds up to this point here of beta roughly uh, one point three two, uh, they come from a simple extension of that argument, and at that point. Um, yeah, this uh, extended um, upper bound is dominated by uh, the upper bound, bound of 0.745 from the known distribution setting. And then on the lower bound side, um, let me mention two stopping rules, um, namely the, the stopping rule for beta equals zero, which uh, is the stopping rule from the well-known secretary problem, and the stopping rule for beta equals one, a variation of which we'll talk about later. Uh, and in fact, all the bounds depicted here, um, they follow from uh, extensions of these two stopping rules. Mm 
as I've mentioned earlier, it is known from ITCS uh, 20 that this lower bound here um, approaches this upper bound for large beta. But this presumably lossy analysis leads to large values of beta, which uh, are not part of this diagram. Results which can, however, be drawn into this diagram are uh, the results by Kaplan, Naori, and Russ from SODA20, who get an improvement for values of beta strictly between 0 and 1. In particular, they do not get an improvement for beta equals 1. Uh, in a paper that appeared in the same conference, however, Correa, Christi, Epstein, and Soto uh, do get a slight improvement um, upon the lower bound for beta equals 1. I've also drawn uh, the straightforward extension of this bound to other values of beta. Another thing I should mention about these uh, two papers is that they consider slightly more general settings um, and um, that still in this diagram, the only tight bound um, is the one for beta equals zero. Even though in this area, it may look like uh, the um, dashed line and the blue line, they coincide. In fact, they don't. With this background in mind, we can understand the contribution of this paper. As mentioned earlier, the contribution of this paper is threefold in that uh, we extend um, yeah, the state of the art for the aforementioned problems in three different directions. The first contribution is an improvement of the state of the art guarantee for all values of beta larger than zero, again, excluding the large beta case of Rubinstein and others from ITCS 20. Um, remarkably, our results are tied for all values of beta between zero and roughly 0.58. Uh, so except for beta equals zero, we thereby obtain the first um, tight bounds. In addition, we get tight bounds within a natural class of algorithms uh, called MRS algorithms that I will define in a minute. And we get these tight bounds uh, using variational cal calculus. Then as a second contribution, we introduced the streaming version of the model. This version of the model addresses the arguably unrealistic assumption that all samples can be stored even if it's a vast amount of samples. While for some algorithms it's unclear how to implement them as streaming algorithms, fortunately um, MRS algorithms can naturally be, be implemented as streaming algorithms in our model. Okay, so that's another advantage of those MRS algorithms that we define. And then as a third contribution, we extend the 1 over e impossibility that you saw on the previous slide to exchangeable random variables. This solves the problem of Hill and Kertz uh, from the 90s. And uh, while the techniques are based on those um, Ramsey theoretic techniques um, from the EC19 paper, the proof requires uh, significantly more uh, effort and uh, in fact an application of Kuhn's theorem. Okay, these are the contributions of the paper. Um, since I don't have time to talk about uh, all of them in detail, I will uh, from now on focus on this first contribution. So let me first show you the improved bounds we get in the figure from the last slide. So um, these bounds are now depicted in red. Uh, most remarkably, as I said, uh, in the range uh, of beta between 0 and 0.58, yeah, we, get tight, um, we get a tight bound. And um, for beta equals 1, we uh, get a much more significant um, improvement than that by Korea and others from SODA20. But how do we get these bounds? Uh, I will now talk about the slight variation of the algorithm from the uh, EC19 paper, uh, which is in fact the baseline for our approach. So the idea is as follows. Um, at each step, the algorithm looks at all the values um, it has seen up until the previous step, that is all the n-1 samples and uh, all the i-1 values on which it could have stopped.
Okay, and from this set of values, it selects a uniformly random subset of size n minus one. And to decide whether or not to select a value xi, this algorithm simply takes the maximum of that uh, uniformly randomly chosen subset um, and sets this value as a threshold for accepting xi. Yeah, so if xi surpasses this maximum of the subset, then xi is uh, selected, otherwise it is not. And for the sake of this talk, we can simply assume without loss of generality that f is continuous, so the probability of a tie is in fact zero. All right, um, to analyze this uh, approach, um, we will use the following lemma, which says uh, that conditioned on arriving in some step i, the distribution of that uniformly randomly sub uh, selected subset um, is the distribution of a set of n minus one fresh samples from uh, distribution f. With this lemma at hand, it's quite easy to see that this approach gives us a guarantee of one minus one over e. So to see that, uh, first observe that um, now the probability of uh, accepting xi is one over n. With this lemma at hand, it's quite easy to see that the above approach uh, gives us a guarantee of one minus one over e. To see that, uh, let's first observe that uh, conditioned on arriving in step i, the probability that uh, we accept um, that we accept xi is one over n. This is simply because uh, that subset selected uniformly at random consisting of n minus one fresh samples together with xi now forms a set of n fresh samples. And of course, the probability that uh, xi is the largest of these values is one over n. And this happens if and only if uh, the above algorithm accepts xi. Okay. And now uh, we can do the following computations. Let's write the expected value that the algorithm selects as sum over all time steps i of um, the probability of arriving in that time step i by the argument that I just gave, that's precisely this quantity, times um, the probability of um, accepting in that um, particular time step, which is just one over n, so also just argued. Um, and then we multiply that with uh, the expectation of um, xi if it's selected by the algorithm. That last expectation, again, by noticing that uh, xi together uh, with this uh, selected subset forms a set of uh, n fresh samples is just the maximum of um, n draws from the distribution. So it's precisely the profits value. Yeah? Um, so if we move this part here out of the sum, the only thing that's left to do is uh, to understand this sum here um, when n uh, tends towards infinity. And it's well known that this approaches uh, one minus one over e. Okay, uh, that's the whole analysis. But how do we get beyond one minus one over e? Well, the idea is to vary the um, cardinality of the selected subset over time. Yeah? And uh, this is formalized by MRS algorithms. An MRS algorithm is parameterized by a function f uh, that maps each integer between one and n to another integer, which corresponds to the cardinality of uh, the subset selected um, in that time step. And uh, of course, this subset may not be too large um, because uh, we can only select a subset of all the values we've seen thus far. And this is really just the number of samples plus all uh, values seen so far on which um, yeah, the algorithm could have stopped. And then this function is really used in a natural way. So in each step i, um, 
the MRS algorithm uh, selects a uniformly random subset of size f of i uh, from all draws seen so far. Yeah, and then the maximum of that subset is used again as a threshold for accepting xi. What's nice is that an analogous version of the lemma from the previous slide still holds. Yeah, so conditioned on arriving in step i, the distribution of um, the set of uh, values selected at this time is again um, the one of a set of the corresponding number of fresh samples. But which function should we use? Not so clear, um, but let's start in a simple way and uh, let's keep looking at this case of n minus one samples. Yeah, so this is a visualization of the function we used before for n equals six. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have these upper bounds on uh, the function values. So because we have only five samples available, um, the first uh, cardinality, the cardinality of the first uh, chosen subset may not um, be larger than five. And so on for the next steps. Um, but yeah, within these constraints, we could really imagine any crazy function, right? But uh, before really considering any crazy function, I first want to argue that we really have an edge on this function that we previously considered by considering this larger class of functions. Yeah? And to do so, I want to consider um, yeah, this type of function. We'll assume that n is divisible by 3. And then there will be these um, three parts. So for the first third of time, um, the function value will be as before, it will be n minus 1. Um, then for the second third of time, uh, the function value will be 4 thirds times n minus 1. And then for the last third of time, um, the function value will be 2 thirds times n minus 1. Now it's not hard to see that in the first third, conditioned on uh, accepting, the MRS algorithm will again get the profits value. Right. In the second third, however, conditioned on accepting, the algorithm will get uh, the expected maximum of four thirds times n many draws from the distribution. Yeah. And likewise, in the last, um, in the last third, conditioned on accepting, the algorithm will get um, the expected maximum of two thirds times n many draws. Yeah. Now the crux of the analysis is how to trade these values against each other. And on the next slide, I will show you um, yeah, what seems to be exactly the right way to do this. So this is the function from the last slide written out formally. And uh, uh, the approach to analyzing the MRS algorithm parameterized with this function is um, yeah, exactly as before. So we'll sum over all time steps again take the probability of uh, arriving in that time step times uh, probability of accepting in this time step times expected value extracted when actually accepting in that time step but now the sum will have three parts corresponding to the three steps of our step function um, the first part however hasn't changed because uh, also the first step still has the same function values as before yeah. The only thing that's changed is how I've written um, the expected maximum of n draws from distribution f. Okay, um, yeah, and then we can actually go on in a very analogous way. So let's um, actually give this probability of accepting in the first uh, part a name, namely t1. Um, and then we can just use 1 minus t1 as the probability of arriving in the second step. Um, yeah, but then um, things are really the same, only that I need to replace n by uh, 4 thirds times n. Yeah, and then uh, we can go on in a similar way. Uh, again, this probability we can express as t2 and use that in the next line. Yeah? And then we can also express this here as T3. Yeah? 
But again, uh, of course, we want to look at large n. So let's take the limit and then uh, everything actually becomes much nicer. So let's in fact write this as a single integral um, and now compare this with, um, yeah, with the profits value, which is, uh, as I said earlier, can be written this way. Now to compare these two integrals, we'll actually show something seemingly stronger, namely that no matter what fx to the n is, yeah, um, the integrand of this integral is at least um, some constant that's larger than 1 minus 1 over e times the integrand of this integral. Yeah. So if we substitute um, f, f of x to the n by a, uh, the inequality that we can show for all values of a between 0 and 1 is the following. Yeah, that's really what I just said. Um, and the constant we get there is larger than 0.637, which is in turn larger than 1 minus 1 over e. By the way, showing this is really just a simple calculus problem now. Okay, uh, so we've seen we can improve 1 minus 1 over e fairly simply actually, uh, but how far can we go with MRS algorithm? So probably that's not uh, the best we can do, right? So we again don't just want to look at this function, but at all kinds of crazy functions. Yeah. And to find the right function, um, it often turns out that it's actually easier to find them among continuous functions. Yeah. So uh, if we have found the right continuous function uh, and let's say we increase n, then uh, we can also get uh, the discrete values again from this function by just equidistantly sampling that function. Um, then we might not have uh, integers yet, but if we want them, round the values, we do. So let's really look at continuous real valued functions now on the domain uh, 0, 1. Just for completeness, Again, we don't want our function to be up here because uh, then it would use larger subsets than it can. Um, and yeah, the two functions we've looked at so far is this one and uh, this one, which is strictly speaking not continuous, but it would be easy to make it continuous at a small loss in the guarantee. All right, so how do we compute the best continuous function now? Well, given such a function g, let's first express um, the expected value of what the algorithm selects uh, in terms of this function g. I don't want to go through this in detail, but this is really the continuous version of what we've done before. Yeah, so this, um, this integral here uh, really corresponds to the sum of all time steps. Then this here corresponds to the um, uh, to the probability of arriving in um, in a particular time step, that's the probability of accepting um, in, a, in that particular time step. And this is uh, the conditional expectation of uh, the accepted value. Yeah. Um, and then in this next step, we move that integral to the outside as we did before. Um, yeah, also as before, uh, the profit, profits value is this, doesn't change. Um, and by taking these two equations here, we now obtain this control problem here. We want to find a function g such that the analogous version of that calculus problem we had on the other slide um, becomes as large as possible. Yeah. Fortunately, we managed to solve this um, control problem using variational calculus, um, but for the details, um, I would like to refer you to the paper. Still, I would like to show you the solution that we get, which is this here. So the um, provably best function g uh, is this here, and it achieves a guarantee of roughly 0 0.6534.
Note, however, that we haven't imposed any uh, constraint on the number of samples that uh, the corresponding MRS algorithm may use. Yeah? So, in fact, here in the beginning, um, that algorithm uses one point, roughly 1.4 times um, n many samples, which may well be too much. So what happens if we really impose that uh, the graph of this function be not in this area here, meaning that uh, the corresponding MRS algorithm uses at most n samples. We strongly conjecture that uh, the best function has the following property, namely that uh, its function values initially for some prefix are as large as they can be. And under this conjecture, we uh, again get the provably best um, function g. And uh, yeah, the guarantee this function achieves is roughly 0.649. All right, and uh, we have a similar picture for other, um, other upper bounds on the number of samples that may be used. Let's, for instance, increase the, um, the upper bound on the number of samples that may be used to uh, 1.1 times n samples. Then we get this picture. If we go to 1.2 times n samples, then we get this picture, and so on. Yeah, um, Until uh, we finally increase this upper bound to roughly um, 1.443 uh, times n samples which is when this uh, constraint becomes redundant. So let's decrease this upper bound again. You, know, uh, you can observe how the, um, how the guarantee becomes worse and worse. You know? So something interesting will happen when we reach uh, roughly 0.58 times n samples, so a number that I had mentioned earlier. In fact, multiple things happen. So this is the first time that the MRS function that we get is just a linear function. Yeah? And also, um, the bound that we get uh, is tied with respect to the impossibility that I mentioned earlier. Yeah? So for n over e minus 1 samples, we now have a tight bound of, uh, in fact, also 1 over e minus 1. One would hope that this stays true as we further decrease the upper bound on the number of samples. Unfortunately, this is not the case. So for 0.5 times n samples, we still get a linear function, you know, but the bound that we get with it is not tied uh, anymore with respect to our impossibility. Fortunately, uh, we can get a tight bound by a slight modification of the algorithm beyond MRS algorithms. The idea is to allow the algorithm to skip some initial fraction of the values uh, and not accept them at all, uh, as indicated here by the missing function value. Yeah? And by doing so and optimizing over the length of this prefix, we uh, again achieve a tight bound. Yeah? And as we further decrease the upper bound on the number of samples that may be used, um, we still get uh, tight bounds this way, all the way down to zero samples, which is when uh, the resulting algorithm um, matches the secretary algorithm. So in this paper, we managed to get tight bounds for a whole range of values of beta and improved bounds for many other values of beta. I would also like to point you to um, this paper by Correa, Christie, Epstein, and Soto uh, that appeared on the archive in November of last year and um, makes some further progress towards closing the gaps. Apart from that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to approach me at the conference or write me an email.